Good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today we'll be talking about bladder changes in multiple sclerosis. Your presenter is Fiona Easton and my name is Annie Sasson and I'll be your facilitator. We begin all our programs with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians past and present on whose lands we meet today. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and we respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. Okay, I'd like to introduce you now to our presenter who is waiting in the wings ready to present. So I'll just give you a bit of a background on Fiona. Uh, so Fiona is an MS Continence Nurse Advisor and has been working at MS for 12 years. Fiona's main role involves conducting continence clinics at the MS Blackburn site as well as the MS Watsonia and Williamstown uh, supported living sites here in Melbourne. Fiona's background is that of general nursing and she is currently a registered continence advisor. She has a four-year psychology degree um, and has experience in palliative care and crisis counselling. Fiona enjoys working with people with multiple sclerosis including those who are newly diagnosed through to those who have chronic symptoms. Um, and she feels that they would be the most resilient pe group of people that she has met. So that is wonderful. So on that note, I'll pass over to <coughs> Fiona. So Fiona, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Annie. Hi, and welcome everyone. And thank you for attending this webinar about the neurogenic bladder. Look, today I will be discussing the neurogenic bladder, which and what it is and some of the treatment choices that are available. The neurogenic bladder is also called spastic bladder and overactive bladder. But one thing that most people um, agree on is this sort of MS bladder can cause social withdrawal and it can be a real embarrassment to have because of the random and unpredictability of the incontinent episodes or or both of a retention and incontinent episodes, depending on what type or what stage of your neurogenic bladder you have. Some of you today might, might have minimal symptoms such as coins, and I call them coins there, like a 20 cent piece of urine incontinence in, in your underwear, or floods, which can be anything up to 500 mil um, incontinent episodes, and they are quite embarrassing. I will talk firstly about the urinary tract, then I'll talk about the normal bladder function in slide 10. I'll discuss the neurogenic bladder dysfunction after that. So if I can have the next slide, please. The urinary tract is composed of two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, internal and external sphincters and a urethra. The urinary tract function basically is to rid the body of waste, drugs, bacteria, uh, excessive water, and it keeps the calcium, sodium, potassium levels at an even balance. It also gets rid of heavy metals. The kidneys produce around two to 2.5 litres of urine a day. The kidneys lie below the rib cage. They are the size of your fist. The ureters are tubes that stem from the kidneys and convey waste products to the bladder. The bladder is a hollow muscular organ which stores the urine and I suppose that's where um, things can go a little bit astray with people who have a neurogenic bladder. The normal bladder function, uh, I'll talk about the normal bladder function and then I'll talk about the neurogenic bladder dysfunction. The bladder wall consists of three main layers. They've got the mucosa and that that is um they are goblet cells. So in that mucosa, you have goblet cells. And often when, I'm digressing a bit, but often when people um, bypass or they have a, a, a catheter in situ, that mucosa in, that, in the um, bladder wall will, uh, will produce much more um, mucus and um, often that will um, block up the catheter. Um, so it's the mucosa, the submucosa and the detrusor muscle. The detrusor is a thick layer of smooth muscle and, ex and expands to store urine, contracts to expel the urine. 
Storage and emptying of the bladder are regulated by the internal and external urethra sphincters, which are key in, um, in someone who has an MS bladder. Sphincters are normally in a closed position. They need stimulation to open. And continence basically depends on the sphincter detrusor coordination. So it's a bit like a, an intimate dance between the, the muscle of the bladder wall and the especially the external sphincter. If they are not, let's say, if the sphincter is stepping on the toes of the muscle wall, that's when you'll have incontinence. So when approximately 250 to 300 cc of urine fill the bladder, the internal pressure activates stretch receptors in the bladder wall. The stretch receptors signal the nervous system. Um, contract waves occur in the detrusor muscle and basically the internal urethra sphincter automatically relaxes. The external sphincter is tightened until that person can get to the toilet and then it will open because what happens in voiding is the the uh, the bladder wall will contract at the same time as the external sphincter um, opens and that that is what happens in and I, I don't really like to use the word normal but it is in normal bladder function so I'll have slide 10 please in 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 the neurogenic bladder dysfunction, the demyelination of MS interferes with the signals between the bladder, the spinal cord and the brain, and it causes urination to become less controlled. Dysfunction may occur in the detrusor, so the muscle, the external sphincter, the one that you do have control over, or the coordination of their functions. The detrusor can be hyperactive, and I'm sure a lot of you may um, know all about this overactive bladder, signalling signaling the urge to void at very low urinary volume. So some people come into the clinic and they say, I've got to go to the toilet, they'll pass 50 mil. Um, so often when the bladder wall is hyperactive, it signals the brain, hey, there's urine in there, but there's really not enough. And this can happen quite a few times during the day. Sometimes um, the detrusor is hypoactive, meaning it doesn't work properly, it's, it's lazy, it's slow. Um, so it allows a dangerously large amount of urine to accumulate before signals to void are initiated. And this is when um, people with MS can have some urinary retention. Uh, uh, so bladder dysfunction associated with multiple sclerosis is caused by the interruption of nerve pathways, like a, a light switch going on and off, but it is random. So the impulses that control the passing of urine are thwarted. And I'll have slide 10, please. Um, bladder dysfunction is one of the most common symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis. So basically 60 to 90% of people who have MS have some level of bladder dysfunction at some stage. I've seen people that have had minimal bladder dysfunction after 18 years of having the disease and I've seen people who have been newly diagnosed and I mean say in the last three years um, having major urinary retention needing to um, self catheterize. So it is uh, it is a nasty disease in that way because there's no no sort of blueprint for it. Neurogenic bladder dysfunction in MS, basically it, 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 it encapsulates the, the signals between the bladder, the spinal cord, the brain are less controlled. So dysfunction may occur in the detrusor, so the muscle, the external sphincter or in the coordination of their functions. As I said before, it's, it's like this, um, the dance of the detrusor and the external sphincter um, is, um, is thwarted, it's just not, they're not dancing properly. Um, so there's three main areas that I want to talk about regarding the neurogenic bladder. One is storage dysfunction, um, and I'll get to slide 11 please Annie. Storage dysfunction, emptying dysfunction, and, and the combined dysfunction. So 
Storage dysfunction may be caused by an overactive detrusor muscle, so that bladder muscle is just saying empty, I want to go, to, I, I need you to go to the toilet now, now, and probably only um, expels about 50, 60 mil. So it contracts prematurely as soon as small amounts of urine enter the bladder. So it's continually signal, signaling the need to void. I'm not telling um, a lot of you listeners anything that's uh, new to you. The bladder does not fill to normal capacity, which can result in the following symptoms. So urgency, I have, I have to go now. So you're at work, you get, you probably get two seconds to warning that you really need to, to go to the toilet. You have frequency, you need to urinate repeatedly. Nocturia, needing to urinate during the night. And usually nocturia is, um, is the inability to, um, basically nocturia, if you're going to the toilet more than twice a night, then um, that's dysfunction. Incontinence is the inability to control time and the place of urine, urination. So a bladder that combines the two types of dysfunction is detrusor sphincter dyssynergia or DSD. So sometimes clients will come in and they will have the failure to store. So they say, I just, I just stand up and, um, and, and, 400 mil come out or a lot come out or failure to empty, doesn't empty properly so they retain urine which is quite dangerous because that urine can uh, reflux up to the kidneys causing the kidneys to bloat and not to function. This can this happens over quite quite a long time but it, it isn't the ideal situation. I'll have um, slide 11 please. No, sorry, back to, sorry, the, the slide before. Sorry, Annie, that was my fault. Okay, so um, the emptying dysfunction is, is what I said was a failure to empty. So uh, this is um, evidenced by urgency dribbling. Sometimes the person will stand up and there's an uncontrolled leaking of urine. So there's a dribble. So they'll need some sort of containment pad in the beginning. Hesitancy. So the, the delay in ability to urinate, though they need to void, is experienced. So they've got hesitancy. They, they'll sit on the toilet and they might have a few bit of a dribble. They can try and double void. Um, sometimes that works. One client said that um, if she has hesitancy, she uses the yogi breath. So that's when the, um, it, it's, a, it's a breath that you use where you're, you're um, tummy expands, you relax uh, your lower half of your body and um, things just happen. You can have um, quite a few mil come out in that way, but that takes time. If you are incontinent, uh, that is another example of emptying dysfunction and infection. Because the urine is stale, it can sit in the bladder for quite a few days, uh, you may um, end up with a UTI. So detrusor external sphincter dyssynergia is a mouthful, but basically it's a failure to store combined with a failure to empty. Uh, it occurs as a result of the lack of cohort between the muscle groups. So urine's trapped in the bladder. There's, it's no one's fault. It is not your fault. It is because of the, um, the lack of innovation or the, it, to the bladder. Uh, so the bladder really does have two messages, store and um, not store. So often the combined dysfunction can lead to, as I said, renal injury, infection, hesitancy, um, fever, increased spasticity. Um, sometimes, sometimes this is, uh, this DSD, bladder dysfunction, signals the beginning of a, an exacerbation or a flare-up of MS symptoms. Sometimes people can, um, this can result in them having a hospital stay or rehab, but you will notice that the bladder may be the first sign of your exacerbation of um, MS symptoms. Okay, and I'll have the next slide, please, Annie. 
what happens in a bladder assessment? Uh, look, when someone comes in, especially to the Blackburn office, um, I mean, I, I can do bladder assessments with the folk at the um, supported Ecom, uh, but someone who's who's new to me, I will absolutely um, do a comprehensive bladder assessment. Uh, I look at the age, the weight. Often, an abdo, a big abdo, abdomen, will impact on the bladder, causing some urgency. Um, a past history, what sort of surgery? Has that person encountered? Have they had a big headed baby? Is their pelvic floor stretched or torn? Um, sometimes episiotomies um, that aren't done properly can cause some internal um, uh, disruption there, causing more urgency. Um, what is that person's hand dexterity like? If they have got, if I've seen that they've got some. Um, urine retention, then down the track I'm thinking maybe they may need to self-catheterise. But if that person hasn't got the good hand dexterity so they can't manipulate a small catheter, then that's a consideration as well. Um, pelvic floor, I've mentioned that before. Even though the MS client may not be able to feel that they are doing pelvic floor exercises, I can teach them in the um, in the continence assessment room. Sometimes I don't have any feeling. They say, I don't know if I'm squeezing or not, but that's because the sensation is thwarted, but the muscle contraction is still happening. Alcohol um, uh, is okay in moderation. Smoking is the big one. Smoking and overactive bladder is like, um, they're not friendly to each other. And I've seen this with people in, accommodation and smoking is your not your best friend at all. Um, it does ab absolutely exacerbate all the symptoms. Herbal remedies, um, some people swear by herbal remedies that help them with overactive bladder. Um, I will often ask the person to complete a fluid balance chart. What sort of containment products are they, are they wearing? Are they working? How is this affecting their sex life? If they've got a catheter, there's different ways to approach that. Um, I will do a bladder scan if that person um, feels that they're not um, passing enough urine. Um, UTIs, um, often UTIs will mimic the overactive bladder symptoms, so these need to be ruled out. Coffee's a big, um, is a big, no, no, really for overactive bladder, but I love coffee, so I would never say to anyone, give it up, but I would say reduce or have one good coffee down the street and then have um, decaf for the rest of the day. Certain foods, spicy foods can irritate the bladder. It sounds like a bland life, doesn't it? But um, so often we'll do, um, I'll, I'll ask for an ultrasound of the kidney and bladder uh, so that person can go to their GP or their um, sonar centre. Eurodynamics, if I think the people, the person that is approaching me has got some um, uh, retention and we need a definitive diagnosis, then I will refer them on to a Eurodynamics clinic, say the bladder clinic in Richmond, and they will measure the sphincter and, and how much they contract and what they will give us a definitive diagnosis. So I'm looking at, okay. That's basically what happens in a bladder assessment. It's a comprehensive review of who you are, what do you want out of this bladder assessment, what sort of surgical history have you had? Are you linked in with a urologist? Um, and really, what stage of MS are you at? Do you know? And often people will leave the bladder assessment till the last. They'll, they'll look at other things, but they just think, look, it'll go away. And it, I can tell you it, it doesn't. Uh, it just, just doesn't go away. So slide 14, please, Annie. Now, this is the big one. Uh, 
what is the treatment for unstable or overactive bladder? So we, the GP or the neurologist will usually start off with an anticholinergic medication and the most common, I think about 68% of people will use ditropin. Um, so Betmega isn't an anticholinergic medication, it's a different brand of medication, it, it falls under a different umbrella. Um, so that Betmega it, um, relaxes the smooth muscle in the bladder, but the anticholinergic medications are really antispasmodic. So sometimes the neurologist or GP will use the ditropin and Vesicare together, sometimes it's a detrusitol, um, sometimes it's just Betmega by itself. Um, a lot of clients tell me I I cannot take the ditropin anymore. Sometimes clients are on a half of a blue tablet, so that's 2.5 milligram twice a day. Sometimes they'll reduce down to just 2.5. Some are on 5 BD. But the side effects are are pretty raw. The ditropin um, Really, you know, you can have um, the side effect is uh, pretty bad constipation and the dry mouth. People just cannot take it anymore. They say I'd rather have an overactive bladder, so they go off the ditropin and then they have incontinent episodes. Sometimes nothing works. Sometimes even with the Betmega and the ditropin, uh, clients will say I don't know what's happening. It, it helps a little bit, it helps for a little while, but in the end, um, I, I just, um, I'm still incontinent. So that's the first line of defence for um, overactive bladder treatment. The second line of defence is your Botox, Botox injections. Botox, just getting my notes. Botox is, is a wonderful thing. This is a real game changer for some people. Sometimes it doesn't work or it doesn't work for everybody. When it works, you will have a person who has um, uh, the injections go right into the bladder. For the next seven days, that person will have some sort of urinary retention. That is the possible side effect. So often we teach the client to self cathedrize just in that first two weeks. Um, uh, and, and then people say, this is a game changer. The, I can urinate normally. I'm just like my neighbour. I can just urinate normally. The Botox injections you can have at the Melbourne Bladder Clinic, um, sometimes expensive. And the Botox injections only last from three to six months. So that's the downside of Botox. Um, there is the old phenol injections um, and the phenol injections uh, are an old um, an old treatment um, basically they they kill the the uh, nerve plexus in there so um, sometimes you'll need two treatments but um, you won't have an overactive bladder but it it is a semi permanent um, treatment Pilates. Um, one of the clients that came in, or more than one really, one of the clients that came in to the continence clinic talked about the value of Pilates. And there was a study done by, um, I've got the name here somewhere, but in 2017 that, that discussed and the Pilates um, treatment for people with MS and Parkinson's disease and they found that um, the increased core strength helped with um, the control over the bladder which was which was amazing. Um, the clients either went to the uh, Pilates studio where they had the adjustable machines or they were taught core strength um, exercises and I've heard this quite a few times that Pilates has saved me. It may not save everyone, but I think it's a really good um, idea to do, to try something naturally first. Some of the clients that talk to me say, I can't really feel that I'm 
increasing my core strength but I believe that the that I am because a trainer is with me and they are saying look I'm doing really well but the proof is in the pudding and they say to me look I'm not um I'm not in incontinent of, I'm not rushing to the toilet as much so it's halved so 50 percent of um toilet rushes are, are thrown away the other two treatments are SNS which is sacral neurostimulation um, look, the the MS population presents a unique challenge, really, because sacral neurostimulation is is a life changer, is a is a game changer for a lot of people. Um, and Adele, I think it's Adele Burgess, um, does this procedure. So basically. Um, it's a sacral nerve stimulator. It works like a pacemaker. It's a small system, so it's surgically placed under the skin to send mild electrical impulses to a specific nerve via a special um, medical wire. So I know Adele does um, test trials for around 10 to 14 days to see if the treatment will work, to see if you like it. Um, the only really, the glitch I suppose with the sacral nerve stimulation is that um, the MS population are a unique population, and I've said that, but usually their disease will progress. So the device may lose efficiency as the natural history of the disease progresses. Um, some um, need to be reconnected, uh, and it's usually used for relapsing, remitting MS individuals. And for individuals who who've not had a relapse for two years, um, the other treatment is PTNS, which is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So, uh, and this is another third line um, therapy. Um, so basically you will get a referral to see someone at a bladder clinic or one of the small hospitals that um, insert these nerve stimulators. So the physician will insert a small needle into the vehicle to stimulate the tibial nerve once a week for the first three months, followed by ongoing monthly appointments and how this works is that it just thwarts the um, the nerve impulses that are coming from the brain and the person does not have an overactive blood. It does take a while to kick in, usually the first 12 sessions you'll see some improvement but the PTNS is usually a lifelong, uh, I think it's once a month treatment and doesn't work for everyone. The, the first um, electrical stimulation device for the bladder was um, touted in the 1870s, um, so there was, it was pretty barbaric back then, um, but these devices really took off in the late 1980s. And the efficiency of it, look, SNS, um, for people that have RRMS and haven't had a relapse for two years, there's about 65% success, but then after um, time goes on and that person may have a relapse or their MS progresses, it's not as effective as the same with PTNS. Now I'll have the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about um, retaining urine symptoms because often MS clients may not, they might feel that they've got a bulbous tummy and they think, gee, I haven't been to the toilet for oh, 15, 18 hours. So some of the symptoms are um, you might have occasional overflow of incontinence because there's so much urine in the bladder. You might have recurrent urine, urinary tract infections. So just try and smell the urine. Maybe you don't, you won't even have the sensation of, say, the burning or um, uh, the irritation down there. You might be getting up at night. That's always a key. If you're getting up at night three, four t 
times a night um, and you've got some smell of urine, you've probably got a UTI. Hesitancy, um, that is another symptom of retaining urine. So some of the urine may dribble out, but the bulk of it is still in the um, bladder. Urgency, I mean, that is really the bread and butter of overactive bladder um, symptoms. And I'll have the next slide, please, Annie. We've talked about detrusor sphincter dysenergia. Um, so the storage dysfunction is, you know, you've got the urgency, the frequency, getting up at night, UTI, sudden flooding, incontinence, um, and an inability to control time and the place of urination. So the external urethra and the the muscle in the the bladder muscle is not coordinating properly. And getting up at night to pass urine, make sure you haven't got a UTI um, that that could be causing or, or clouding the um, the DSD symptoms as well, or adding to them. And the next slide, please. So we talked about um, the medication. Uh, so, and the some of the um, things that you can do for DSD. Uh, and so, basically, someone who has a DSD bladder, they're not passing any urine, they are in trouble. There's, there's, there's no, there's no, every way you look at it, they've got to get that urine out. So there's that, that bladder is just holding onto that urine, might have a few dribbles, you might even have a five cent coin of urine and think, oh, well, that's all right, some is coming out. But, but it is dangerous because that urine has to go somewhere and it just backs up. It backs up to the ureters and into the kidneys that bloat them and then you can get some um, some real problems with um, kidney damage permanent. So basically, if the person comes to me and says, I, I don't, I've tried double voiding, I've tried doubling over, pushing the urine out, I've tried yogi breath, uh, and nothing seems to be working. I've tried warm compresses, um, I can go to the toilet, um, probably one day out of the three and the rest it's just it's just sitting there. That is the time where the urologist and the GP and myself work together and we work out a plan for clean intermittent catheterization. So um, some clients have come to me into the into the clinic to say I've I'm sick of this, I cannot pass urine, can you help me to pass the tube into my urethra. So um, I teach them, they have a mirror, they pass the small catheter into the urethra and usually do that about eight times a day. It is hard. It is hard in the beginning because it seems like an unnatural thing to do, like passing a tube into your urethra. But the body is a, a surprisingly amazing vessel um, and it will accommodate those small um, catheters and there's a, a range of catheters out there at the moment that are quite quite lovely easy to handle um, I was at the last year I was at the um, the the continents um, the big continents conference that, that um, all the, all the um, Australia wide um, and uh, international conference on uh, continents and one of the speakers was from Brazil and he was saying that in the future, uh, the world of um, catheters may look like uh, very, very different to it, it to what it is today. Usually, you'll use a catheter, you'll get rid of it in um, in, a, in a clean and safe way. But he was saying, look, they are doing studies about soaking the catheter in salt and water or Milton's or washing it with just water and reusing them, not only for the environment, but um, because he said it's looking like it will be safe. So I suppose um, uh, that remains to be seen. So I'll wait for the results of that study. So clean intermittent catheterization. we've had quite a few people at the Supported Ecom who have 
tried the clean intermittent cathedralization. They've done that for themselves for, I don't know, eight years, nine years. Then because of dexterity issues, mobility issues, falls, they've had to have a, an IDC, which is a catheter that goes through the urethra. The other type of catheter is the suprapubic, which um, goes, you have a, a little hole in your um, abdomen and that, that tube goes straight into the bladder. And they, sometimes the SPCs, the suprapubics, get a bit of a bad rap, but um, you can tuck them away if you go swimming or having intimate relations, or you can tuck them away and tape them and, and put a little stopper on the end. So um, they are versatile. Um, they have their own uh, <laughs> unique problems, and one of them is um, sediment. You will get some sediment in the indwelling catheters, but um, not as much as the SPCs because that tube is going um, straight in, straight into the bladder. So is the IDC, but for some reason, the SPC creates much more sediment um, in people that have them long term. I'll have the next slide. Um, we've talked about this really urinary tract infections. So there's stinging, burning, urgency, frequency. Um, you're getting up at night. Um, to pass small amounts of urine. Um, and as I've said before, sometimes the UTIs are a trigger, not no, trigger's not the right word, are an indication of um, an exacerbation of MS. So I've heard people that say, I woke up, I cannot move, I couldn't move my arms or legs, and I've had flooded the bed, or my overactive bladder symptoms were just worse the whole all the symptoms were just bad but the urine was the overactive bladder and all all retention was one of the worst uh, and that usually leads to a hospital stay a review of medications rehab and then that person often is just back to where they were prior to the um, exacerbation and the next slide Some simple things to help reduce infections are, look, I know probably all of you are doing this, but drink plenty of clear fluid. A lot of people say, but I have nine coffees a day. So the caffeine is a diuretic. It'll draw moisture away from the kidneys, which isn't a good thing. Um, so just plain water is good. Don't restrict fluids because of incontinence, because the bladder wall will become inflamed. Add lemon to the water, which seems a little bit um, crazy because lemon is acidic. Why would you add that? But it's a citric acid in the lemon that will help um, cleanse the bladder. Cranberry, the evidence-based reports about cranberry say that doesn't do much, but anecdotal evidence from people that still take cranberry say they wouldn't be they wouldn't be without their cranberry tablets or juice. D mannose is a great little um, adjunct to uh, helping to decrease UTIs. It's it's they are tablets. Um, you take uh, I think it's twice a day. You take them and it if you've suffered from E. coli um, infection, sometimes that's really just um, uh, it's, some part of the bowel contents has somehow got into the urethra or um, the D mannose can help with that. So it makes the E. coli stick to each other and not on the bladder wall causing infections. Probiotics, I'm a big um, fan of probiotics because basically they help keep the gut clean and also that is where your serotonin is produced. I know we're not talking about the bowel today, but the, the serotonin uh, production happens in the large bowel and is um, really is um, responsible for your mood. So probiotics, good ones are essential. Keep antibiotics to a minimum, but at the same time, um, don't, um, push away any symptoms of UTIs because sometimes people um, need the um, antibiotics to just clear the UTIs. The other other things like, um, ah, you've got, 
Hyprex. Now Hyprex is a tablet that, look it's probably best to go to the GP and talk about Hyprex but you can get it at Chemist Warehouse. It's for people who've had known E. coli UTIs. So um, the Hyprex prevents UTIs and I've seen this um, couple of people at the supported a com UTIs, UTIs um, have had Hyprex now for three years and probably one UTI every one a year. So I'm a fan of Hyprex as well. Um, and the next slide please, Any. So the basic first aid for bladder problems, just review your caffeine intake. Um, I don't want to be a coffee Nazi, I love coffee, but have a look at the decaf varieties because the caffeine um, it, it just irritates the bladder wall. I've got one guy at one of the ACOMs who loves his coffee and, and yells out, I'm by bypassing, he's got a SPC. So I say, how many coffees have you had? Oh, you can't take that away. And I, I, said, I say to him, look, I don't make up the rules. Your bladder hates the caffeine. Try decaf for five of your coffees and just have one coffee um, when, to start your day. Review the fluid intake. Make sure you're taking, drinking clear water. Elevate your feet. Elevate your feet because this gives your kidneys a rest. When you are on your feet all the time, the kidneys, the kidneys work hard. They're wonderful organs. But if you elevate your feet, it gives the kidneys a rest. They can, it's like they are having a rest as well. They're still filtering, getting rid of um, all the toxins, but elevating your feet helps them. Avoid constipation. Uh, if you have a bowel full of hard feces, it will often um, bump up against the neck of the bladder, causing overactive bladder symptoms to become worse. One change at a time, um, just you can slowly introduce some of these changes. You don't have to do them all at once. Diet and exercise, the, the diet, um, Diet, of course, is probably a hard one, but introduce some fibre and, and celery is such a good thing for your um, celery juice for your bladder. But the exercise, the Pilates, the walking, um, all help to um, keep your bowels moving and to keep you um, keep the blood flowing and and the blood is infiltrated everywhere. So you you're just healthier. So talk to your MS nurse or continence nurse or doctor about any medications that you'd like to try or um, even patches for giving up smoking. Uh, next slide please. So MS Connect is the, um, actually Annie I'll go back, I'll go back to that last slide, sorry about that. Um, a couple of you have written to um, the education expert here at MS and have asked me to answer some questions and I will do them one at a time. And I appreciate um, you sending me the questions because it gives some um, format and it gives some um, bones to what I'm talking about. So these are real world questions. The first question, a weak bladder what is a weak bladder? Do I have one? Well, the answer to that is a weak bladder is usually another term for overactive bladder, spastic bladder, MS bladder. Basically, it's a bladder that will not hold much urine due to its overactivity. Question, how can I gain better bladder control? Basically, have a talk to your neurologist and urologist, trial the Pilates, the pelvic floor exercises, even if you don't feel that, oh, I don't feel that I'm actually squeezing those muscles due to the MS and the lack of sensation. Keep trying to do them anyway. There are um, devices that you can, they're invasive, but there are devices that you can pop in um, and, and you can squeeze around them and that will increase the um, pelvic floor. Question, how can I prevent and deal with incontinence in the future? This is a tricky question and I would answer that by saying, the MS bladder is by nature an unpredictable organ. Keep well, exercise, um, mix and match your meds, talk to your 
GP or neurologist about meds that aren't working or are working, alternative therapies. Um, there's someone at the at Com that swears by um, a therapy that reduces the sediment in her SPC. Um, look at different containment and washable products. Um, question, controlling incontinence. Um, so I would say, how would you control your incontinence? I would answer that by saying, which type of MS bladder do you have? So it needs a really comprehensive answer to that. And um, prior to that, it, you really need to understand where that person is coming from. How do I manage a spastic bladder? Answer, thorough investigation about what type of bladder you have and making sure you eat and drink healthily. It may be that you have, have to start ditropin or use containment pads, washable underwear. It depends on the type of bladder or degree of overactive bladder you have. Do you have coins or floods? Question, I have an intermittent difficulty with initiation of void and we've talked about that. So often with a neurogenic bladder, there is dyssynergia, meaning there's a lack of coordination between the brain and nerves telling the bladder what it must do. Having the bladder spasms, wanting to void, but that external sphincter will, will be closed. So dribbles out some urine or none. There's just an incoordination between the bladder muscle and the external sphincter. And this often happens with faecal incontinence too. Um, question, I have, uh, I have SPC sensitivities when I have my SPC changed. The answer to that is some people have enormous pain when changing their catheters. I change 22 catheters roughly every, I don't know, four to five weeks. Some, some blokes I talk to, I'm changing the catheter, they talk about how their footy team is just not doing really well and they say, have you changed it? Others, it's quite dramatic. They'll need a diazepam, 10 milligram, palexia, so that's a neuropathic pain drug, 40 minutes and nothing less before the SPC change. We put on mood music and I say, trust me. And this uh, same person has been um, having this for uh, about nine and a half years and nothing has changed. Her um, pain in that area is just severe and it, it never will be any different, unfortunately. So we just work around that. Um, why does my SPC block up and what can I do? The first port of call would be drink water and you can trial alternative therapies, which I cannot recommend because they're not evidence-based, but some of the clients are supported a com use an alfalfa product called chlorophyll liquid and it removes toxins and alkaline. Um, so anecdotally, I would, yeah, this is um, proof of the pudding. That, so this person doesn't block up and this person's had this catheter for 11 years. Um, there are also, and I love them, pre-packaged bladder washouts that have to be organised by either Bolton Clark, myself or the urologist. And they are, they come in three different sorts of, they're like little IV bags. So they are 3.23 um, citric acid washouts um, and you've got um, another washout that is, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, anyway, that, that helps with um, E. coli infections. So there's three types, mainly the citric acid ones are the ones I use at, um, at, a, at a com. And um, I've seen them work really well. I've seen them refresh the bladder. So you pop that uh, 60 mil of the um, citric acid washout into the bladder and you let it sit there and then some of the urine comes out through the tube and it's um, quite lovely, nice, nice and bright. So I do that. Um, I incorporate that into the um, client's um, NDIS plan, so that happens say once a month. Uh, there's no um, uh, side effects with these B brawn uh, washouts, and um, they've really helped people um, who've been constant or what we call frequent blockers. They've helped people change over from being frequent blockers to 
having a normal change every six weeks. Um, how often should I change, uh, use an intermittent catheter? Some folk can um, put in their intermittent catheter eight times a day before breakfast, morning tea, after lunch, mid-afternoon, 5 p.m., last thing at night. Some people can get away with emptying their bladder three times a day with the um, intermittent catheters. I would not suggest just the three times a day, but if you're not suffering any UTIs and you're draining quite um, substantial amounts, um, then I would say everyone's different. Question, I'm taking Orbagio and Ditropin. Sometimes Orbagio can trigger cystitis, sometimes. Um, and the Ditropin, of course, will dry everything up. Um, so you've got, um, you've got a dry system and the Orbagio has, does have some side effects. The answer to that would be, I would ask my neurologist for a trial of another um, disease modifying drug. The best treatment for UTIs is d manose lemon and water. Hyprex is sometimes used to keep the urine alkaline and I've seen reductions in UTIs with people um, who've taken this. Uh, pregnancy and overactive bladder, uh, what do I do? The, the short answer to that is both will make each other worse for the duration of the pregnancy due to the pressure on the bladder and the neurogenic, um, and, and the neurogenic bladder. So um, the pregnancy will um, put pressure on the bladder and the overactive bladder will just remain worse. Um, so I would say, and I have told this to a client, keep self-catheterising, keep everything clean. Um, I, and even um, some women have had an IDC in the last month of their pregnancy. So they're not, this is just a choice, but they're not rushing to the toilet for that last month of uh, pregnancy where the, your belly is pretty big and you can just drain that into a bag. When giving birth, you may have an IDC popped in afterwards anyway, and then things just revert back to um, pre-pregnancy. Um, um, that really is all the questions I have, and I've answered all of them. So I think that's about it, Annie. I think we can go to the next slide. So MS Connect is your best port of call for continence issues, um, especially people who have an NDIS plan. The National Continence Helpline, they're fantastic people. Uh, 1800 330 066. They can answer all of your questions. Um, and your GP. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Fiona. That was um, certainly very interesting. Um, now, um, thank you for responding to those questions that um, everybody posed when they registered uh, for the program. Uh, we've since had a few more questions come through, so yeah. um, I'm mindful of the time. We've got about five or ten minutes to go. So. Yeah. Um, uh, the first questions come through from Linda. Linda would like to know, can we get the pelvic exercises um, to help with these conditions at home? Um, is there a list or, a, or a, um, a program that can be followed for pelvic exercises? Um, Linda, if you want to leave me your, um, your details, I will, I will get them to you. There are also devices um, um, that are invasive, but they they do work, but if you give me your email, I will email you some um, um, some resources. Um, that's great. Thank you, Fiona. We actually have Linda's email address um, in the system, so I'll share that with okay. you um, when we when we're done. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Fiona. Um, as far as um, uh, a bladder assessment, uh, are you able to to provide a bit more information on how we can get one and what's involved? Um, perhaps we can send out a handout to um, the the participants that are on today. Yes, there are there are a slew of questions that I ask um, 
that I can I can um, grab them and send out that handout. Um, so there's lots and lots of questions that I that I do ask, but it really depends on the person's um, uh, what they're presenting with. Someone, um, yeah. So it just depends. Someone might have a history of bedwetting since I was seven, so that that's going to be a lot more. Um, lot more involved but I do have a basic handout that I can share with people um, afterwards. That will be great perhaps if you send it through to me and I can send it out to everybody. Thanks. Um, thank you Fiona. Uh, and Lynn Lee has asked um, how do you access the Melbourne Bladder Clinic? Uh, do you need a referral? And she's also asked separately um, anything that they do is it done under general or local anaesthetic? Um, the the um, the general anaesthetic will be the phenol injections. Um, the local anaesthetic will be for all other procedures. But I, I will also send a link to Lynn Lee to or to you to yourself. All right, great. Um, and there's also also with the Melbourne Bladder Clinic, there is also Adele Burgess. Um, yeah, Burgess. Okay. And I'll just I'll send that as well. Thank you. Um, uh, as far as the PTNS regime goes, how often should you repeat that um, process? Um, um, how many P times a week? There, it, it's 12 sessions and I'm pretty sure it's once a week for those 12 sessions. If the PTNS is not working uh, and it won't work for everybody, they will let you know probably in the sixth session. But the PTNS unfortunately is a lifelong um, uh, uh, procedure. Um, and I think I did say too that as, as people's MS progresses, hardly anyone's MS just remains static. Um, as it progresses that um, the PTNS can become less effective um, but I can send some information to you and Ian. Okay. Sure that would be great and I'm happy to share it with everyone. Uh, okay. A couple of questions regarding water. Alison's asking uh, how much water is enough per day? Is it two litres? Um, and also Marion is asking would the lemon in drinking water stop the sedimentation forming in the PC, sorry, SPC catheter? No, no. If you're, the short answer is no. The lemon in the water, I I always give that to folk who I've changed after the SPC, always have, get the limes from the tree, the lemons from the tree, and that just flushes everything out after the citric acid infusion into the bladder for frequent blockers. For people that sometimes can't go without um, having some sediment in their tubing for 10 days, doesn't matter what they do, they are they're just called frequent blockers. But the lemon helps, but it will not will not get rid of the sediment. But if you if you drink if you drink three liters a day and you you can exercise, often that will push the sediment through. But I've seen Usually people who have an SPC, and I'm not saying everyone, but usually people that have an SPC aren't as mobile as your person that hasn't got an SPC. So two to three litres is, is ideal per day for water. Okay, great. Um, Marion, uh, sorry, not Marion, uh, Diane is asking, where do I get uh, d mannose from? You can get that at um, Chemist Warehouse. Um, and there's another name for it, um, Eurofem. So that's Eurofem is the other name for it, and D Manos. Now it's about, I think for a month's supply, it's about $45. So um, I can send uh, some information to you, Annie, about the D Manos. That would be great. Thanks, um, Fiona. Uh, and also Diane's mentioned she's had some great success when giving up smoking. Um, yeah. She says that she's recently given up and she can verify that her bladder issues have improved significantly. Yeah, so that's wow. really fantastic, Diane. Well done. Wow, that's not an easy, good on you. Yes, mm. that's terrific. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fiona's saying that she has severe uh, continence when voiding. Um, she often self uh, uses yep. self cath, and yep. the voiding is very chain uh, changeable in retention. Um, and it has been suggested that she has Botox. So how would Botox help with continence? So can I can I um I'm trying to get this um so this lass um self catheterizes um sometimes she gets urine out and sometimes she doesn't is that correct any it seems to be she's saying that it's very changeable in retention oh okay um hmm. I suppose the, that the the main part is um how does botox help with uh, continence. Botox helps by um, basically freezing the bladder wall um, so you will you will have like inverted commas a normal bladder you will go to the toilet after 7 to 14 days of the injection so after 7 to 14 days you will um, go to the toilet you'll press and you will you will um, urinate normally on the toilet that only lasts from uh, three to six, sometimes nine months. The injections only last that long. The thing about um, this lass who's self catheterizing, um, self catheterizing, and she doesn't. Mm, gee, I'd be. I really would be going to you a urologist. There's no easy answer for that. Usually, people who self catheterize will get the amount out. Sometimes people have strictures where the urethra gets skinnier and skinnier because it doesn't like the fact that there's some um there's um regular intermittent um catheterization so you need the really really good expensive um uh intermittent catheters and even mm. with that you have to be some people just catheterize they've been doing it for um you know 12 years uh there's no trouble they use the cheaper catheters but some need expensive catheters and they still have trouble which is a real real problem for them but yeah definitely I'd go to Melbourne bladder clinic or get an appointment with a urologist but if you don't think you're getting enough urine out um, that's a problem that's a problem it, it's it could be technique it could be the type of catheter that you're using but usually when the urine flows it flows and, and it probably could be UTI so you've got some burning and and that would make the whole um, caboodle just too um too sore for you i'd start off with a gp um and um get a urinalysis for a start okay thanks fiona just a few more slides um as as mentioned ms connect is there it's the the gateway to all our services on the screen is uh several reasons why you may want to call ms connect um they're just a few reasons there are many many other reasons as well uh, our peer support program is available. Uh, it offers one-on-one -on -one phone support or face-to-face -face groups, which are now temporarily converted to telegroups uh, for the current climate. Um, there are also Facebook groups. So you can um, chat online um, or get together on the phone with others who are living with MS and discuss um, how you're managing uh, with your symptoms, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and you can share our information and ideas. And the three ladies there on, uh, on that slide are the program coordinators in the various states. Uh, Get Your Act Together is an online tool which is available on our website. It helps manage uh, your um, MS symptoms or the main MS symptoms, and you can access that at, on our website as I mentioned. Employment support services um, that is available um, through MS and you can access that through uh, the MS Connect line um, on 1800 042138. Uh, MS is a registered NDIS provider um, and on the screen there are the services that are available in the various states. Uh, My Age Care is also available if this applies to you if you are 65 years or over and those details are there on that, that slide. So once again, um, MS Connect is the gateway for all the services that we offer. Um, if we um, don't get to your questions today, 
um, you're welcome to contact MS Connect directly on free call 1800 042 138 or you can email them at msconnect at ms.org.au. Everyone take care of yourselves and thank you Fiona for presenting the webinar today. Um, Pleasure. And, and we look forward to seeing you online very soon. Um, take care. Bye thank for you now. everyone. Bye-bye.